Welcome to session three for Understanding Safeguarding and Prevent, brought to you on behalf of Poplar Harker by Solutions Equinox Training Solutions. My name is Phil Church and I shall be your session narrator. So following on from the previous sessions, what does your learning journey look like? Well, we had session one, which was understanding the prevent duty. And by now, you should have made a start on your written assessment. Don't forget, we have full tutor support throughout the program if you are struggling with this qualification. You only need to give us a call or email us on our support email at learners at solutionsequinox.com. Then we had session two, understanding safeguarding. And again, followed by the written assessment too. This is your final session, which is covering understanding online safety. And followed by that is the completion of a written assessment on e-assessor. Session four, which will have as an additional support session if you require it. If you do require it, you only have to give us a contact, uh, details and supplies with a phone number, and we can arrange that for you. Once all your work's been internally quality assured and externally quality assured, you'll be awarded with your level two certificate in understanding, safeguarding and prevent. Don't forget the rules for completing your assignments. It's important to understand the action verbs because they are what define your answers and what allows you to pass your qualification. And these action verbs that we've been using are defined your answer must give the precise meaning of a word. Describe. In order to describe something, you must give a detailed account of it. Remember what I've said previously regarding describe. I don't want to just see a list. I want to see detailed features around what you are covering. Explain. You need to ensure that your answer is clear, revealing relevant facts. And identify. Your answer should establish who or what something is. Don't just list it. We want to see some details for it as well. We will tutor you throughout the whole program and help you to complete the three assignments. And once you've submitted your assignments, they will be assessed and you will have regular tutorials with your tutor throughout this program. And all of your completed assignments will then be submitted for internal and external quality assurance. And once this process is complete, you will be awarded your qualification. Don't forget, if you are struggling, you can contact us on our remote assistance service where we can contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com and it's important to mark your emails as cash to safeguarding so they don't get lost in amongst any other emails that may come in and consequently there is also our telephone numbers if you wish to give us a call. So this is session three and session three is covering understanding online safety. And by the end of this session, you'll be able to understand the potential consequences of inappropriate or illegal online activity. And be able to understand how to reduce the risks posed online. And know about potential signs and behavioural changes that could cause concern. Now, following from our last video, we covered understanding safeguarding. So have a think about what you understand the term safeguarding to mean. Have a think about some examples of national and local safeguarding organisations. And if you were to be notified or you had suspicions that abuse had been taking place, what would you do? So understanding our online safety for our online lives, have a think about how much we rely on the internet to live our lives. And how much personal information do you post online? Have you ever put something on the internet that you later regretted? If so, why was that? Our reliance on the internet. As you've seen, the internet is a large part of our lives as it's used for work, socialising and managing our daily activities. However, it how we conduct ourselves online is very important to the potential consequences of what we do. It's easy to assume that we live two separate lives, one in the real tangible world and the other which is intangible online and is often thought of as unaccountable. 
every time we use the internet we leave a trace of our activities and our searchable history. What we assume to be private may in reality be in the public domain. Potential consequences of online conduct. Illegal downloading of software, music, films, images or publications. On conviction, you could be sentenced up to 10 years in prison for partaking in copyright crimes. Hacking the Computer Misuse Act 1990, which is unauthorised access to computer material or unauthorised access with the intent to commit or facilitate the commission of further offences. And it's also unauthorised acts with the intent to impair or with recklessness as to the impair of the operation of a computer. The Police and Justice Act 2006 and Serious Crime Act 2015 is the unauthorised acts causing or creating risk of serious damage, making, supplying or obtaining articles for use in an offence. And each of these offences carries a sentence of between 3 to 10 years imprisonment and in some cases life imprisonment. For certain offences. Hacking offences committed on systems in another country may lead to your extradition to that country to stand trial. Gambling. A recent report, it was estimated that two million people in the UK are addicted to gambling and consequences of gambling include losing vast sums of money, an addiction, bankruptcy, Losing possessions and family. Loss of employment. Terrorism and terror related grooming. Following the terrorist attacks on the 11th of September 2001, the internet has become instrumental in radicalising and recruiting for terrorist groups. There are therefore police powers in place to disrupt such activities online and terror related activities include Grooming by using flattery, bribes and threats. Targeting using social media to contact the young and vulnerable. Use of encrypted platforms to avoid coming to notice. And online terror offences are covered by the Terrorism Act 2006, which is designed to disrupt the training and recruitment potential of terrorists. Most common offences individuals are charged with under the Terrorism Act are Section 5, which is the preparation of terrorism acts. Section 58, which is collecting information and hostile reconnaissance. Section 2, which is the dissemination of terrorist publications. And those individuals who have committed offences are subject to special custodial measures and these include no entitlement to automatic release at the halfway point of their sentence and only released if no longer deemed a risk to public. Financial scams. Theft has been taking place for hundreds of years and so have financial scams. However, as technology has evolved, so has the means to defraud individuals through the internet. There are many different ways in which scams are committed and these include fake websites, fake emails, Selling something that is not described or does not exist, and that's fraud. Fake text messaging. And if found guilty under the Fraud Act 2006, sentences range from a maximum of 10 years in prison and or fines between £20,000 and £100,000. Bullying or harassment. The Protection from Harassment Act 1997 deals with all instances of harassment and where a course of conduct on more than one occasion is pursued by another person which he or she knew or ought to have known amounted to harassment will be guilty of an offence and this could include repeatedly texting, emailing, trolling online and so forth. Sentences range from fines to imprisonment and associated offences of misuse of communications to make prank calls, send texts, emails, silent calls and so forth come under the Communications Act 2003. Creating and uploading inappropriate material. 
some content is deemed inappropriate for consumption irrespective of age, morality or any other factors or values. And this material includes photos and or videos of child abuse, violence or cruelty. Photos and or videos that glorify and promote terrorism. Material that includes sexual content. Material encouraging criminal activity. And the sentences for this range from 5 to 10 years imprisonment for possession of indecent images of a child to 15 years imprisonment for viewing terrorist content online or publishing such content online. Did you know between 56% and 70% of employers check the social media of current or prospective employees? This is open source material and therefore it is deemed to be in the public domain. You could be disciplined for bringing your employer's name into disrepute. Police forces state that if their employees post on social media, even if they believe it to be private, they consider it to be in the public domain. So question one is asking you to describe the potential consequences of online conduct. So going over some of the original material we covered was prison sentences losing money, addiction, bankruptcy, unemployment, losing family, friends and possessions, being arrested, tried under the Terrorism Act, being a victim of a financial scam and being prosecuted under the Protection from Harassment Act 1997 or Communications Act 2003 and being prosecuted under the Fraud Act 2006. Potential consequences of online contact. The harvesting of personal information. Some people are targeted so that valuable information can be stolen from them. Criminals will pose as someone of a similar age or someone with a shared interest. And contact can last for prolonged periods of time until the information that is sought is secured. Information includes names, dates of birth, bank details, addresses and so forth. And identities are then used to access bank accounts and steal cash or credit cards to make unlawful purchases. And consequences of this include serious financial issues, depression and anxiety, and a protracted process to cancel bank cards, claim back lost funds and return to normality. Bullying harassment and stalking. This activity can take many forms and those who perpetrate it do so in the belief that they are protected through anonymity of the internet. Harassment, bullying and stalking can have serious consequences on victims leading to depression, anxiety, self-harm and withdrawal from social interactions. Grooming Grooming through the internet is a serious concern as victims are often children or vulnerable persons and we have already discussed aspects of how this is done. There have been cases where victims have arranged to meet the person or persons that they were interacting with resulting in serious assaults and murder. How many of you have easy to remember passwords? Are your passwords based on pet names, places of birth or other personal information? How easy would it be for someone to work out your password or obtain your personal details from an interaction online? Remember, putting personal information on social media pages where this is in the public domain opens the door to misuse. How many of you are going to post that you are going on holiday? How hard would it be to find out where you live, work or study? Question 2 is asking you to describe the potential consequences of online contact. So remember we covered having personal information harvested, serious financial issues, depression, anxiety, difficulty restoring credit status, bullying, harassment, stalking, grooming and remember don't just make a list of these please I want to see some detail about each of these information bits that you are getting please.
online advertisements. Young children or vulnerable people may click on what appear to be genuine advertisements when in reality they are fraudulent and are designed to upload malicious software to their machines which steals data or damages its functions in some capacity. Children are also vulnerable to accessing online content that is not suitable for their consumption. Violent and hateful content. As covered earlier in the session, the internet has become a recruiting tool for terrorist groups as they seek to radicalise individuals they seek out on various forums. Hateful or violent content is known to have disturbing consequences on some people and they are emotional damage and being sympathetic to extremist groups and having copycat actions. So using your workbook three on page 15 that you may find on eAssessor, research Mohammed Rayman and Sana Ahmed Khan and research Darren Osborne at Finsbury Park. Because question three is asking you to describe the potential consequences of online content. And remember some of that content could be being influenced by adverts, being exposed to violent, hateful content. And don't forget again, remember the action verb here is describe. Please don't just list what you have here as the bullet points. I want to see some detail around these supposedly the key features. Acceptable use policies. When signing up to an internet service provider services, it is standard practice to sign an acceptable use policy, which contains the rules and guidelines for using the internet and an IT network. Most organisations, including schools and colleges, will have such an agreement for staff and learners to sign and agree. In the workplace, an AUP tends to focus on why it has been created and the areas it covers, such as the use of emails internet, voice and mobile equipment and IT equipment. It will also typically cover the company's privacy policy and how this relates to other network users. The AUP will also list what employees must do or must not do, such as allow anyone else to use their ID or passwords. They must not use someone else's ID to access IT systems or access data when that person is not authorised to do so. Make unauthorised changes to IT systems and they must not leave machines logged on when unattended. They must not connect to unauthorised or insecure networks and they must not leave passwords unprotected or transfer data to outside organisations. They must not access or download, send or receive data, including images which are offensive, sexually explicit, discriminatory or libelous. They must not remove antivirus software or use the system for personal use unless authorised to. And there are many more. At home, when signing a contract with an internet service provider, you are agreeing to their AUP. For domestic use, they typically cover the following areas. They encourage the freedom of expression, but not at the expense of other users. The policy applies to the account holder and other users in the household. And this policy applies to all devices that are connected to it. And users must not encourage hate, promote violence, send unsolicited communications, cause harassment, intentionally cause distress, offence or behave in a way that could harm vulnerable people or children. And devices must have up-to-date firewalls and antivirus. Failure to comply could result in a termination of the account, formal warnings or restrictions on accessing illegal material and blocking access to services. Educational establishments. The online risks associated with the internet and children is almost self-evident. It is a requirement of Ofsted that schools include e-safety in the curriculum and that staff are kept up to date on how to keep their learners safe whilst online and many schools have AUPs for learners and staff. Ofsted rules state that all school staff should be able to recognise e-safety issues with this element being a priority.
and priority training given to staff and the wider school community. And pupils should have an excellent understanding of how to stay safe online with social media and mobile devices. And progressive e-safety curriculum and good risk assessment and IT age filtering. Similar AUPs are in place for students, teachers and colleges and universities and they must be written in a clear, easy to understand language and they promote positive use of technology. They clearly outline behaviours that are acceptable and unacceptable. They document how the networks are monitored and the teachers will be responsible users. Networks will be used for educational purposes and the school's systems are protected from misuse. And the staff are protected from potential online risks. AUPs will also include monitoring policies, network use purposes, and they will list what staff are not permitted to do online, password and username security, access to attachments and images, and so forth. So question four is asking you to explain the contents of an acceptable use policy for each of the following contexts for the workplace, for the home and educational establishment. So remember in the workplace, the creation statement, network access statement, company privacy policy and so forth. At home, who the policy applies to, what the policy applies to, online do's and don'ts and so forth. And for teachers, monitoring policies and statement about the network's function and a list of do's and don'ts and so forth. Now remember, explain requires detail. So do not just make a list of bullet points as you have seen here. I want these expanded with some key features and how these work, please. AUPs reduce the risks online. So have a think about how do acceptable use policies help reduce the risks online and think about the one that you may have for your household. Well, you may have come up with the following. AUPs protect an IT network from activities that increase risk. AUPs provide a framework and rules for everyone who uses a network and it decreases the risk of accidental or purposeful putting the network at risk. It protects the company, other workers and confidential data and sets restrictions on what may be accessed online. And finally, it restricts software downloading and so forth. Question five is asking you to describe how having an acceptable use policy reduces the risks posed online. So key points to remember, to protect IT networks from risky behaviors, it provides a framework and rules for all network users to adhere to. Ensures the prevention of inadvertently uploading malware, malware or spyware. And again, the key word here in this question for the action verb is describe. Failure to comply with an AUP. What do you think the consequences of failing to comply with an AUP might be? Well, some of these consequences may be a risk of security breaches to an organisation, corruption of data, breach of legislation such as the GDPR and a risk of prosecution, restrictions being placed on users or prevention from being using the network, uploaded content removed, and users' information being passed to law enforcement, legal action being taken against the user, and disciplinary action or dismissal from an employer, and damages being paid to third parties. Question 6 is asking you to outline the consequences of non-compliance with an acceptable use policy. So some key points to remember here are increased risk of security breaches to the organisation, corruption of data, breaking the law under the GDPR, which can lead to prosecution, the user being restricted or prevented from using the network, any content uploaded by the user who doesn't comply may be removed, 
the user's information being passed to law enforcement agencies and many more. Who, what, when? As Abraham Lincoln once famously said, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. The internet is a fantastic source of information. It's also a fantastic tool for spreading misinformation. Audiences are targeted based on their political profiles, affiliations, connections and interests. So check the source of your information and ask who, what and when. Can you think of any examples of fake news and what the consequences were? Who? Who are you communicating with? Is there a way of checking the identity of this person? Catfishing is pretending to be someone else online and stolen identities are often used. Exercise extreme caution and don't take things at face value. There have been instances when individuals have been encouraged to share intimate pictures with a person and these have then been posted virally online. Once something is online, it is public. What? What are the person's intentions? What do they stand to gain from the interaction? Do they want money, images, information? And when? time does the individual make contact this may give an indication of their identity contact in the early hours of the morning only should raise suspicions if it feels odd and wrong it probably is question seven is asking you to explain why learners should ask who what and why when interacting with with others online who do you know the person what might their motivations be? And to avoid sharing sensitive information with a stranger and determine trustworthiness. What are the person's intentions? What could they gain from the interaction? When, if a contact is on at an odd time, it may indicate that the individual is not who or where they say they are. And information online, remember, who, to find out whether information is credible or accurate, what, to find out what the author may gain from disseminating the information, their intentions, this may influence the content they create, when, this helps to determine how recent or accurate the information is and helps individuals to identify the best information. And remember, the action verb here is to explain. So I want to see some extra detail and maybe some examples thrown in of what you have dealt with in the past or what you have witnessed on the news to go with these answers, please. Potential behavioural changes that may be a cause for concern. Everyone experiences mood swings at some point in their lives. Not everyone is able to communicate how they feel, especially when dealing with difficult situations. There are, however, signs that someone may need help and support, and some of the pointers may include being withdrawn, being secretive, taking dangerous risks, underachieving at school or college, abusing drugs or alcohol, spending excessive time online, texting, gaming and social media, the children may be unkempt, unexplained physical injuries and being nervous and a loss of confidence, an inability to sleep, regularly experiencing nightmares, self-harm, Absence from work, school, college or an unwillingness to go. Aggressive. Obsessive. Suddenly being ill before work, school or college. The use of social media platforms are known triggers which can have a detrimental effect on mental well-being. Some help and support. Victim support. Bullying UK. The NSPCC. The Internet Watch Foundation. Revenge Porn Helpline and Childline and the Cyber Foundation are all very good help and support charities that are there to help people in these circumstances. 
and sources of advice regarding online safety are such as the UK Safer Internet Centre, Think You Know, Get Safe Online, Childnet. Question 8 is asking you to describe potential signs or behavioural changes of a person that may be a cause for concern. And some points to remember for signs are such as these, and behavioural changes are these. And remember, the key action verb here is describe. So I do not want to see some bullet points here. I want to see some expansion on some detail that you may have you wish to use on some of this list. And maybe some examples of where you have come across this or some that you have researched. And question nine is asking you to identify sources of support for those who have been affected by an issue online. And question 10 is asking you to identify sources of advice regarding online safety. Linking everyone together. Your program has covered the following units. Number one, understanding the prevent duty. Number two, understanding safeguarding and prevent. And finally, understanding online security. If you have any questions regarding this video or any of the questions that you may need to answer, please don't forget you can contact us at learners at solutionsequinox.com marking your email cash to safeguarding. We hope this presentation was helpful to you and we're always interested in hearing your feedback. So why not leave us a message through our website or on our SETS channel on YouTube or you can contact us at learners at solutionsequinox.com. And I thank you for your attention and for listening.